Hello, I'm Andy Stevenson and welcome to another episode of A Winning Mindset, Lessons from the Paralympics, brought to you by the International Paralympic Committee and their long-standing partner, Allianz. Together, our aim is for these podcasts to help you move forward in all aspects of your personal and professional lives. By hearing from Paralympic stars, you'll be introduced to stories that inspire and change the way you think. Stories of facing life's challenges with confidence, determination and excellence, and the true power of having the right team behind you. Wherever you get your podcasts, you'll be able to hear any of our previous episodes with the likes of Sharif Osman, Grace Wembalua and Tatiana McFadden. And like McFadden, the Paralympic star on this episode is a lady who stayed at the very top of wheelchair racing for several years, moving from track medals to marathon glory all around the world. She is Swiss star Manuela Scher. So Manuela, hello, and, and where are you joining us from today? Hello, I'm here in uh, Kriens in Switzerland. Lovely. So I'm imagining mountains, yeah. lakes, cowbells. Exactly. Am I close? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds a, a, an idyllic place to, to, to grow up. What, what was it like uh, being a child and, and growing up in such a beautiful area? Uh, it's amazing. Um, as a child, you can spend uh, most of the time outside, you know, playing with other kids, yeah, it's really beautiful. Once you get to see other places, you always enjoy coming home to that beautiful nature and beautiful views and fresh air, you know. <laughs> so I really love it here. Sounds lovely as I look out my window at a very grey English day. We're obviously going to talk about your career and what people listening might be able to learn from how you've stayed at the top all, all these years. But uh, I just want to ask about your your disability, it was um, because of a playground accident, wasn't it, when you were eight, which left you paralyzed. Can you, can you explain the accident and what happened that day? Yeah, it happened at my school friend's um, birthday. We played in the garden and they had a swing built on their own and it wasn't deep enough in the ground. So seven of us uh, played on it and it, it, it just fell down and it hit me on my back. And that's how it happened. Luckily, it was just me. The other kids were able to jump away and and yeah a horrifying thing to happen at a children's party are your yeah. are your memories vivid of vivid of it or is it one of those where you have a have a blank in terms of what you remember no I, re I remember pretty much everything I well it's funny that I don't really remember what happened before the accident but then from the accident until I was at the hospital I remember you know pretty much everything it's unusual that you you remember everything from the point of the accident onwards. It's funny because when I, when I talk to my friends, sometimes I realize that I remember so many things from when I was really little. Um, and that's kind of funny because some, some of my friends, they don't have really uh, any memories of their childhood, but I remember so many things. <laughs> and what was it like having everything in your life change so suddenly, so violently, really? Uh, it was... Definitely the most difficult time of my life, of course. It did not only change my life, but also my whole family's life. And it was, you know, as a child, it was difficult to, to be at a hospital for so long. I spent there six months and I, you know, I was homesick and didn't feel well. So I just wanted to be home. I miss my parents. I miss my friends, of course. And then that's just the one side. And the other side, of course, is just um, that your body totally changed and you have to learn yeah what what happened to your body what what will be and how you have to take care of it and yeah to get back into a normal life mm. and that took took many years you know, I, I am interested in the idea that you know this awful moment happened to you at a party when you were surrounded by your friends and then when you come back to those same friends you're different. You're the same person, of course, but yeah. you're you're different. Your body's different, and you have to get used to that. But also, they had to get used to that. It must have been quite strange, sort of doing all the things you had been doing with those other children, but in a in a different way, in a wheelchair. It was very difficult for me to come back because um, also you are the center of attention. Well, where I grew up, it's a really small town. Uh, you know, everybody knew about that accident. Everybody knows my parents. Everybody knew me. And then coming back after six months and everyone just stares at you and feels a little bit, you know, um, uncomfortable. 
uh, that was really, really difficult. But it was it was a tough time. And also, like you said, I changed a lot in that um, six months. Um, so I had to find a new role inside my fr- friends. Yes, yeah. And, you know... Your, that, your position in the friendship exactly, group changed. That took a while. That took, that took me a long time. Would you say that becoming paralyzed forced you to mature more quickly? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I had to. I mean, you have to get to know your body in a such, such in a different way because as a child, you, you think nothing's going to happen to you. <laughs> It's mm. like that na- naivety, is that a word? I yes, yeah. English. It's like it's so innocent and then suddenly your whole world just falls apart and everyone a- around you that, that is supposed to be strong for you, like even your parents, they're totally, you know, help- helpless and mm. overwhelmed. So, um, yeah, you have to grow up a little bit and, and take responsibility were you able to return to the same town, same house, the same friends even that had been with you at the party? Yeah, I was lucky. I had a really nice teacher and uh, he did everything to, you know, to um, keep me um, on the same level as my, my schoolmates. So um, he came visit me and, and brought me, you know, uh, school homework and stuff like that. So I was able to return to the same class and um to the same house also but it wasn't um wheelchair accessible so they mm. my parents had to carry me <laughs> every day <laughs> when i tried to leave the house and we moved only like a year after it's so important isn't it i mean uh, oh, yeah. speaking to you know previous guests on this podcast series and i know from my own life as well as a disabled person it's so important that or it can be so significant when you have the right people around you mm-hmm. at that moment you know you mentioned this teacher and obviously your family but not everybody has that do they and it's so it's so important and lucky that when when you have one or two of those individuals around you at that time to say okay, we're going to get on with this and we're going to help Manuela have the same life or, you know, as good a life as she would have had if this accident hadn't happened. Oh, it's so important. That's why not everyone is um, taking the same path, you know, because sometimes people ask me, what would you say to someone who just got injured? And I always say it's so hard to tell because everyone has another background. Everyone has different people around them and everyone comes from a different, you know, point of life. So... Um, it's really just important to have a good network, like a good people around you. You um, you eventually found wheelchair racing and, and sports. What Did you love it straight away or what was it about wheelchair racing that you found appealing? I actually met uh, my first coach uh, when I was still at the hospital because, um, you know, at that time we had a really nice group of wheelchair athletes who trained in Nottville as well, like, you know, legends like Heinz Frey or Franz Niedlisbach and all these people. And I used to be a runner before my accident. And so athletics was always a part of me. So um, I think at first it was just to be included in that group of people who were really happy and nice and Hmm funny and didn't uh, treat me like a different person or you know what I mean yeah absolutely. I felt really comfortable and really safe there so that's probably why I picked wheelchair racing and that's so true isn't it of so many people whether they're disabled or not they actually take up sport almost for the kind of social aspect and the teamwork aspect they don't ever think they're going to be an international athlete in some cases Uh, (laughs) and and you probably weren't thinking that at the time but Obviously, you've gone on to gone on to great things. We're um, we're going to speak t- to you quite a bit about performance and how you manage your performance and how, in particular, you've kept your performance levels so high over so many years. But to to put all that into context, I'm just going to run through your your role of honor, if you like. You've won the Grand Slam of major marathons. You've won Berlin, Chicago, New York, Tokyo, Boston, and London. You've competed at four Paralympic Games. Uh, a silver and bronze in Athens and a bronze in Beijing. You couldn't bring any medals home in at London or Rio, which we will we will talk about. Were you somebody who was setting goals on a regular basis, or was this you know maybe just at the start of every year? Or yeah, when I just did uh, track, 
uh, it was pretty much every season because um, most track events take place in summer. So um, I would work uh, during this the winter time and early early in the year to to beat my times from last year. And what happened when you say didn't hit those targets or reach those goals? How did you deal with that? You know, I only had that really big times in London and Rio. I think as an athlete, it's really important how you deal with with um, disappointments also because it's it's going to be a part of your life uh, no matter what. So um, I think you can turn um, bad experience or, or not reaching a goal in, in something really, really good um, or it can go in a really, really bad way. So I think... I somehow turned it into something good and, and took it as a, as a, can I say, as a teacher to grow. And, you know, you learn from every mistake. So it's really important to, to not um, ignore those moments mm. and just keep on going. So you have to really analyze and take, the, take something out of it that helps you. But you also had a pretty significant um, teammate and and friend, um, sort of alongside you, in albeit in the in the men's races rather than the women's races, and that's uh, Marcel Hoog, your fellow Swiss star of the Paralympics. We've actually got a little message from Marcel here, so let's listen to him. Since the beginning of my career, Manuela and I have been companions. We both experienced so many things together. We not only were getting older through all these years, but we also went through great development in our uh, personalities and our sport. Especially Manuela's progress since Rio 2016 are uh, very impressive. I hope she can keep going like this and stays healthy and then I'm absolutely sure that she will win gold medal at the Paralympics in Tokyo. Well, not a bad vote of confidence there coming from Marcel Hoog, who, like yourself, has won Paralympic track medals and road medals aplenty. And like you, he moved from the shorter track events and progressed up to the marathon. And I'm thinking that people listening may have changed their own career paths or changed their ambitions and they'll understand the various things you have to consider when you do something like that. What was on your mind as you made the decision to focus on the longer distance races? First of all, they cancelled the 200 metres for the Paralympic Games. So that was one of my favourite distances. You know, I just realised that as a um, complete paraplegic athlete in 100 meters it's really it's really hard because you know we, we race against the uh, amputees and uh, you know athletes that have more upper body ability and I think in in 100 meters it's really really hard to to keep up with 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 those athletes so that was the other reason and then also I got older and <laughs> I realized um, you know it's easier to to uh, to train for the longer distances because then you, it's just really a, a, a question of training. But does the marathon training involve lots of extra things that you maybe didn't have to think about quite so much at the shorter distances? I'm thinking about nutrition and even more physio, massage, uh, you know, the whole the whole thing. It feels to me like training to be a marathon athlete must must take up every hour of every day yes i still i I still have a lot of track track training even a shorter distances because it helps me for the marathon a lot and i think that's really important to to mention that that's a really big difference to uh, compared to the runners we still need that fast ability in the marathons because you know the attacks and the heels but also yeah i had to change a lot and had to learn a, a lot because uh, marathon racing is different. You only have that one day. Um, it's sometimes raining. It's windy. It, that's it, everything it makes it so so much harder. But you like that. You you like that challenge. I like that challenge. You love yeah. that challenge, I suppose. It's, it's not it's not like it's love, isn't it? Now I know your coach Claudio Pere is a very important part of your team. What's his role? I mean, he's clearly trying to make you a better marathon racer, but more broadly than that, 
What role does he play for you? Well, he knows so much. Like, he's such a smart person. Um, so he's like the head behind or the brain behind my, my, my training or my, my arms. Um, he does all the training planning. We do the season planning together. Yeah, it's really, it's really helpful to have such a, yeah, a person um, in your team that knows so many things and is so motivated to, to make you stronger and faster. It's really fun to work with those people. Well, you speak so highly of him, so let's hear what he, he has to say about you. Until Manuela reached her present high level of performance management skills, she had to pass through several steps in this process. And she had to learn what it really means to train like an elite athlete. Manuela's decision in 2013 to change from short race distances to longer ones up to marathon races, of course, had also some impact on the training process. In this context, I remember an episode where she was asking me, are you really sure I should do a 70-minute endurance session without any break? Her feedback from this session was, this was a horror. On the other hand, I had to fight with her because she was not convinced that the weekly day off would be beneficial for her. In the meantime, Manuela has found a good balance between training and recovery and her regular training feedbacks, followed by a critical analysis of the training content, helps to keep a good performance level. It's really interesting hearing him and it just highlights um, it's such a crucial relationship, isn't it, between an athlete and their coach. It's it's like, you know, any employee and their manager or perhaps even somebody and their, their mum or their dad or, you know, or their mm. wife or their husband or their partner. It's you have to be completely in tune with each other, don't you? Yeah. And I think it's really important that you learn to speak the same language. That, that might sound really weird, but um, it took us a while until he exactly knew what it meant when I said, I'm tired. And that's really important that he knows, you know, where to put that, that feeling of me. <laughs> so usually now he knows me so well that he knows that I'm, when I'm tired before I even know it. So that's really impressive. <laughs> <laughs> because what kind of feedback do you respond to best you know uh, i have to f feedback him on every uh training i give it a number you give him a, a score is it you give him a score to say how much how well you thought the training session went is that right uh more like how hard it was <laughs> uh okay okay yeah. uh, out of uh 10 and so <laughs> i'm assuming are they are they all 10 or i actually only put a 10 once I think that was after my first New York City marathon. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, it's funny because all the, all the sevens and eights became a total new meaning. So my first New York City marathon changed my whole, you know, perceptions of these numbers. <laughs> mm. But you do this every single session. You give a score of how hard it is. Yeah. And, and, you, and he writes it down and he keeps it. Yeah. Is he quite tough with you? Is he quite soft on you? Can it, can it change day to day? What, what kind of approach do you like best? He's not, he's not a mean coach. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, I, you know, I have a way to, to tell him my goals. <laughs> That's what he told me once. Um, that it's not easy when I come up to him and say, hey, um, I want to I wanna do a world record in the 1500 in uh, May this year. So I think I make it sound like, please, <laughs> could you please uh, make this happen? So that's how we challenge each other. And since I'm uh, very uh, demanding, I'm, I'm actually willing to, to, to work hard. And I think we, we both want to go in the same direction. So um, it's not that he tries to torture me. <laughs> Because, you know, I do it for myself. I'm not doing it for him or anyone else. Now, work-life balance is something we all have to think about. And your coach mentioned that he actually had to persuade you to commit to a regular day off every week from training. How did you feel about that when he first suggested it? 
He said, what do you think about one day, you know, Friday off? Because, you know, I work two days a week and then weekends, I usually have a lot of time for training. So um, how about Friday? And I'm, I'm like, no, it's why not training or why not do just one session? And he really wanted me to actually do that. So um, just a few weeks later, I thanked him so much because it's, it's, it's so important to have that one day a week. And it's always that one day a week. So other athletes, they ask me, but what, what do you do if you see that Thursday, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be raining and Friday is going to be a beautiful day. I, I still, Friday is my day off. <laughs> <laughs> and what happens on Fridays? What do you do on Fridays to relax? I, you know, a lot of me time. Yeah. Um, whatever I feel like. Sometimes I just go out and walk with my dog a long, you know, mm. a long time. And then sometimes I just go to the city Sometimes I just stay home, read a book or listen to an audiobook or whatever. In sports, obviously, your achie achievements are very easily measurable. You can see quite clearly, have you had a good season? Have you had a bad season? Do you reward yourself for good performances? Yeah, mostly with food. <laughs> 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 I, I think it's, it's just it's. It's so important to to celebrate, to enjoy the good moments in life. Um, and I had I had years, especially when I just started to work with Claudio, like 2013 and 14. I had goals, you know. I was really I wanted to win and so bad, and I always got second. And then I realized you just have to also enjoy the good moments. And uh, the things that you have achieved, you know, we, we, we come back from Boston and then two days later we, we travel to London and it's just everything is happening so, 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 so fast. It's really a shame when you, when you, when you forget or when you, you know, when you forget to celebrate and when you forget to, to enjoy the moments that you actually work, worked for. Mm. Um, and I really, really try that very, very hard to 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 save that that positive feeling for later because it's going to be over someday so one day and i want to remember everything and those moments of celebration and you know the, the the fridays you have to yourself i guess they're also all part of recovery aren't they and and they stop you from burning out exactly it's important to have those moments not not just physically but also mentally because sometimes it's really um can be tiring um you know all the pressure and the traveling and you know and just ha feeling like you have to win all the time <laughs> <laughs> i can imagine is quite tiring actually 2019 was the toughest year so far even though everything went so perfect and so good for me um yeah it, i was really really tired <laughs> mm. after that season And that was the season, you know, that was an incredibly successful yeah. season, the most successful season. So that's interesting yeah. to hear that that was, that was the toughest one. Mm -hmm. uh, do you work with other, do you work with, a, you know, any sports psychologists or anybody else? Or does it all come through you and Claudio and maybe your family, I guess? Um, I started working with a, a mental coach um, a few months ago, actually, last year. Yeah. Um, I saved that for... For many years, because I, I, well, one thing was that I didn't really think I needed it so much. And the other thing I was, was I wanted it to say for, you know, for a really important year, like 2020. Mm. Mm. Well, that's <laughs> one, but um, yeah. And I felt like I had so many other um, things to work on. I didn't want to work on like a million little things because then you don't you don't um, see what helps you the most um so yeah i i work uh, i work with someone um and it's really interesting i enjoy it it's um i think it's an interesting part of of being an athlete the, the whole mental abilities hmm. what would be i mean i think we've talked about a few of them but what would you say the secrets are to the fact that you have been able to stay at the top for so long you know moving from track to marathon you've been successful at both and you've had a very long career now how have you managed to keep your performance levels at the same at the same heights as you know 15 20 years ago there's no secret i mean it's 
such a big puzzle and so many small pieces that have to fit together. It was a long time until I had, you know, the perfect environment for me to train. Perfect chair, the perfect coach, uh, perfect, you know, uh, life. Also, your body has to be willing to do that. It's a lot that we ask from our bodies to, to, to deliver. And we, you know, the theme of this episode has been performance management and, and keeping it going over a number of years. How long do you see yourself competing for realistically? That's a really good question. Um, I'm not getting any younger, so <laughs> it's something that it's in my mind a lot. And I think it's a, maybe this year is a good time to really uh, think about it a little bit more because um, I'm someone I really need to have a plan. I don't feel comfortable ending something without having another thing in the pipeline. You know what I mean? Mm, mm. So um, I think it's going to be a process and my feeling is going to tell me when it's the right time. So maybe it's when another door is open that I, that I feel ready to, to actually let that one go. Or maybe it's me deciding until then and then, and then I'll start another thing. But um, yeah, I, I don't have any fixed plans yet. So it's, it's, in, pro, it's in progress. <laughs> I think you've guessed my, my final question because, you know, I think listening to you and, and hearing you talk about how much you love the fact that this sport consumes your whole life. And as long as you, you know, you have bits of time off to, to relax and things, you are happy with the training, you are happy with, with it dominating your life. Do you ever think about what you'll do when you can't race anymore? Yes, I do think about it a lot. It's the same thing. I don't. I, I can imagine different different um, things. Maybe it's it's within sports, something like you said, coaching, or or maybe for um, federation or whatever. Mm. Or I could also imagine that I want to try to do something totally different. Um, yeah, I don't know yet, but I hope it's gonna be as exciting as as uh, being an athlete. <laughs> because we're really fortunate and really lucky to to be able to live that life of an athlete. But do you think there are things you've learned in your sporting career that you could take with you into the next phase of your life and apply apply certain things that you've learned in sport to that next career? Oh, I learned so many things. I think sport is such a good life teacher. Um, you learn so many values um, that are important. And Such as? You know, if you work, you get something back. Following rules, uh, mm -hmm. just, you know, you cannot do whatever you want. It's, 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 um, it's important that, you, that you're fair, that you, you know, respect people, and also how to live with, 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 um, with a passion. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's just great that you can do something that, that is so important to you and gives you so much back. So that's not, I think a lot of people are looking their whole life to, to find something like that. Well, I, I look forward to seeing whatever it is that your new challenges are in the future, but I'm sure you're going to keep competing for, for a long time as well. And it's been really interesting hearing about how you've managed your performance over the years and your relationship with your coach. And I'm, I'm going to go and buy myself a flip chart with a big bit of paper and, and a pen, and I'm going to start recording scores for things that happen in my life. I'm going to take that away and, <laughs> and use that definitely. Uh, but thank you very much for your time, Manuela. On a Friday, your day off. So I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thanks. Quite the career to talk about with Manuela Cher and so many useful tips there about how to manage your performance no matter what job you're in or which sport you play and the importance of having the right team around you. Please do subscribe to this podcast and listen to earlier episodes. Leave us a review and a rating if you would like. Next week we have something a little bit different for you. I'll be speaking to Hollywood actor RJ Mitty who shot to fame playing Walter Jr., in Breaking Bad. RJ has cerebral palsy and worked for the British broadcaster Channel 4 at the Rio Paralympics. I'll be talking to him about sport, disability, his career and about the representation of disabled people on screen, which has taken a few damaging blows recently. Don't miss that one. 